everybody to the spring lecture series um, that's titled Blue, Green, and Gray Infrastructure. I just wanted to go uh, quickly about the next lecture, which is actually um, was submitted as a UGA signature lecture, and so it's going to be on the UGA signature lecture series. And it is titled Valuing Water, Culture, and Heritage by Carola Hine. Um, it will be on Monday, March 27th at 4.30 in the chapel. So mark your calendars for the next um, lecture that we have planned. But today I'm excited to be introducing James Schulte. Uh, James got his BLA here in the college when it was a five-year program. He went out in the profession after that for eight years and then returned to get his MLA here. Uh, while in practice, he worked um, on a variety of projects from California to Bahrain and Florida to Maine and a lot of places in between. So he has experience in infill housing projects, mixed use design, uh, town planning, urban design and resorts, and hotel master planning among many other topics, including his topic today. So when he came back for his MLA, he turned his hobby of staring out the window, waiting for the printer in his office, into his thesis research and his talk today titled Vegetated Roof Adoption in an Urbanizing World. It's about the many facets of green infrastructure practices, focusing on vegetated rooftops and how they can help control environmental damages caused by construction and urbanization. And if you haven't checked it out yet, he has a really cool TEDx UGA talk online that you can watch. And that is similarly titled, City Under the Sedums, Vegetated Roof Adoption in an Urbanizing World. So check that out after this, after he does his lecture today. So please help me, help me welcome my friend and yours, James Schulte. Thank you. Morgan, can you hear me? Can you all hear me up in the back? All right, cool. Uh, so first of all, thanks everybody for coming out. This is, uh, this is really exciting to be here. Uh, when I was a freshman at UGA, I thought I might want to major in art history. And so I enrolled in an art history class. And while I loved it, I, wasn't, uh, I didn't fully understand how to transition from high school studying and um, time management to college studying and time management. And so the night before our final exam, which I needed to pass to pass the class, we had an ice storm. And I stayed up all night uh, the night before studying. Woke up, uh, I guess the ice storm knocked out our alarm. I woke up five minutes before the exam in a panic. Uh, ran out uh, my dorm, found a friend to drive me. We fishtailed out of the parking lot because it had iced over everywhere. He dropped me off. I ran into the room and got, uh, sat down right before the test was handed out to the row. And that was in this room. So it's really exciting to kind of come back full circle. And if you would have told me, like, when I was running in thinking I was going to fail that first art history class as a freshman, that I'd be back here being able to lecture for you all. Uh, I probably wouldn't believe it. So it's a real treat to be here. So thank you all. Uh, what are we talking about today? We're talking about vegetated roof adoption in an urbanizing world. I love the title. I don't know who wrote that title. I didn't, but I think it's fantastic. Uh, and so what we're going to talk about today is my, my goal for the talk is not to take it strictly academic. Uh, you know, I wrote this as my thesis. I defended it as a thesis in a very academic setting. Uh, I was invited to give a TED Talk where they told me, really kind of dumb it down so you can share it to middle schoolers. So I had to take like a very scientific academic topic and make it really um, kind of level that anybody can understand. And now kind of what I would like to do is kind of blend those two because not everybody in here knows maybe knows a whole bunch about vegetated roofs. Uh, so I just kind of want this to be an introduction to some green infrastructure practices, uh, what some of the issues are around the world, around our climates. We're gonna, I'm going to talk really quick just about how this came to be, the origin of it. We're going to discuss what a vegetated roof is, some of the different types. We're going to talk about what the issues are uh, in our world and our climate. We're going to talk about what some of the existing um, measures against the issue are, and then we're going to talk about how vegetated roofs can also help that. So uh, Associate Dean Steffens wasn't lying. I, I turned my passion for staring out the window, uh, waiting for the printer at our office into my, my thesis topic. Because when I came back to school, 
I was trying to think about what really excited me about uh, the professional design world that I wanted to really study and turn into a thesis. And so I was remembering that this is the view when I was standing at the, the printer um, looking out the window into downtown Atlanta. Sorry, that's not the view. That's the view. That looks a little better on a postcard, right? That doesn't. So I, I just remember there are so many days, uh, probably hours, that I'd spent waiting for prints to come out of the printer that I was just watching. This is Linux Mall in Buckhead, and if anybody is familiar with Atlanta or the Atlanta area. Um, but I remember, you know, from staring at open parking lot with not a lot of tree cover to the top of parking garage to this massive amount of just open roof, and I'd often wonder, well, why isn't there any vegetation on the roof? How would that benefit us socially, economically, environmentally if it was? Because one thing I really noticed is for about a week after it rained, there was always standing water that you could still see on the rooftop. I'm standing at the printer. I'm looking this way. If I turn uh, almost 90 degrees to the left, this is my other view. Sorry for the, uh, the glare here. But another just bare open rooftop, a lot of bare parking garages, a uh, whole bunch of rooftops. This is in Buckhead. This is Linux Road, and Peachtree is behind us. So that's kind of how I got into studying vegetative roofs. That's what made me in, um, excited about this topic. And hopefully over the next about 50 minutes, uh, I can pique some interest of y'all's into vegetated roofs. So what is a vegetated roof? Well, quite simply, it is a rooftop of a building or a structure that is covered with vegetation. Pretty much it, it is what it says on the card, right? Early on, you'll also, um, you'll also hear these uh, described as green roofs. Green roof, vegetated roof, same thing. When I started writing my thesis, uh, Professor Calabria was my thesis advisor, and he said, why don't we transition to vegetated roofs? Sounds a little more academic, and it's a little more um, of the definition of what it actually is. Because if we're being really pedantic about it, this is a green roof, but it's not a vegetated roof. Every time I see uh, LeConte Hall here on campus, I just think about what a big green roof we have on campus. So uh, vegetated roofs are mainly divided into two main categories. We have extensive and intensive. Uh, extensive is, uh, typically has a shallower substrate, which is pretty much the soil, the, the uh, growing, um, what the plant is grown in, typically about two to four inches. Um, and it is suitable for more turf grasses, ground covers, and sedum. So something like this vegetated roof, uh, this is an extensive roof in New York City. Whereas if we look at an intensive roof, it has a deeper substrate, typically uh, greater than six inches in depth. Uh, it's able to accommodate larger plantings, such as uh, trees, uh, taller grasses, like switch grasses or muley grasses, and larger shrubs, such as this in southern Japan. And the architect here wanted to illustrate gray, uh, green over gray with this, uh, with this design. Intensive roofs uh, also can have water features, typically have people on top of uh, more amenity areas that are usable rather than the extensive roofs. So in any vegetated roof, uh, the, kind of the simplest one for an extensive roof, we've got about five main layers. We have our, uh, we have our growing, um, we have our, our uh, plant, we have our substrate, which is the soil matter, we have a drainage or retention board with uh, textile geofabric over it. We have waterproofing, we have insulation, and then we have the concrete roof structure. This is for an, uh, just an extensive green roof. Things change a little bit if you go into uh, intensive or a uh, green blue or a blue green roof, uh, but this is just kind of about five layers for a typical extensive roof. If we look side by side of what extensive and intensive are, you can see that uh, extensive or typically lighter weight because we have a lighter planting material. It's just that kind of sedums, ground covers, turf grasses, whereas an intensive roof can have heavier plant material. Uh, as I said before, an intensive roof typically has a usable amenity area because you're spending all that money. You want to be able to bring people up to the roof, where an, an extensive roof is more uh, about environmental benefits. Uh, because we're not uh, providing as, um, as deep of a substrate and as many as, as large a plant material. Extensive is lower cost compared to intensive. Um, and the, the biggest benefit for extensive is typically they're the most suitable for building retrofits. retrofits.
as well as new construction. Whereas intensive, it's harder to go and retrofit an existing building because that roof has a uh, carrying capacity weight load that it can accommodate. There are some other terms you might have heard before. A blue-green roof essentially just means that it's, uh, it's got a little extra layer that it can retain more stormwater. It can capture that stormwater and it can hold it. Um, for the, uh, after the rainfall event happens, the plants can then transpire that back up through their leaves. There's also a semi-intensive roof, which is kind of between the extensive and intensive. There's a modular roof, and then there's white roofs. A white roof essentially is just instead of having tar cover the top of the building, you paint it in a lighter material that has more reflectivity, and so it doesn't contribute as much to the urban heat island effect. This is an example of just what a modular roof looks like. This was a retrofit. You can see the, I understand, I'm sorry, the, the picture is not great here. This is the existing rooftop, and this uh, extensive roof has been built up. You can see on the supports. This, so this is kind of under, uh, under the uh, roof system, looking up at just kind of how it's built. And then you can see these black trays that are the, the modules that the plant material sits in. So the benefit of a modular roof is if uh, an area of the planting dies, you can quickly just take that tray out and put a new tray in, and it doesn't look as bad. Uh, we're going to take a very quick crash course of vegetated roof history in about a minute and a half before we continue on. Probably one of the most famous you've ever heard of is the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Right? King Nebuchadnezzar built it for one of his wives as she was missing her homeland. So we have vegetation that's sprawling in and around the complex and on top of the roofs. Uh, that would be ancient history, more modern history uh, in the Middle East and Scandinavia and even the early settlers into Nova Scotia and the Northeast build their, um, their structures with kind of moss, grass, or lichens on the top of the roof, and that's to help storm, um, keep stormwater out of the dwelling, but also it uh, provides insulation in the winter and provides cooler temperatures in the summer. And uh, this is a, a rooftop in Kensington, London. This is uh, on the top of a department store. This was built in the late 1930s, and it's just over an acre in size. It had a very, uh, built after a Spanish garden feel, just over, like I said, just over an acre in size. And this was kind of revolutionary for the time. Really got people excited and interested in vegetated roof development around that time. Um, in the US, late 30s, you know your history, we're coming out of the Great Depression. Uh, so this kind of kick-started a reinvigoration into, um, into vegetated roof development. In the 1950s, we're just flying through history here, um, Germany used to develop their roofs with a, just a, like a waterproofing membrane and some gravel. And over time, uh, due to soil and uh, coming in with birds and uh, seeds coming in through that, plant material started to sprout up on the rooftops and they started thinking, well, why don't we do this intentionally and why don't we start developing more uh, vegetated roofs in our cities and study that to see what the environmental, economical, and social benefits would be. So from the pretty much the 50s to the 70s, Germany kind of paved the way in vegetated roof development. Uh, this is a, an example in Stuttgart. And then a more recent one that I saw in an email uh, the other day, this is a, a factory in Vietnam that's just been uh, completed. Whether or not you call this a vegetated rooftop, uh, I really thought it was interesting just because uh, I wanted to show this just to, so y'all can see kind of architecturally what some of the different styles are. Is this a vegetated wall? Is it a vegetated roof? Maybe it's a little bit of the both, but uh, kind of how things have evolved over time from the earliest times into now. All right, that was a really quick crash course. So let's talk about the issue. What is the issue and where is the issue? If anybody's been in any of our lecture series uh, so far this year, you've probably heard some overlapping themes. And one of them that we've talked about is world population. Right? So we can see a, a graph of pretty much what the world population's done from the uh, beginning of the common era up until now. And then we've got actual uh, numbers right out here that you can see when we cross the 1, 2, up to 8 billion mark. So if you can think about it, from the beginning of uh, human history up until uh, 1930, it took that long to cross 2 billion people in worldwide population. But to go from 2 billion to 4 billion, it only took 44 years. 
4 billion to 6 billion only took 25 years, and then 6 billion to 8 billion where we are today was only 24 years. So we've had an astronomical growth, oops, excuse me, of world population as you can see. And when we grow that fast, there's only one thing we can do is we expand our cities, right? We uh, sprawl, we build outward, we build upward, and we have a lot of rooftops that come into development because of that. In 1990, we had 10 megacities in the world. A megacity is a population of over 10 million people. And by 2030, you can see that it's estimated that we'll have 43 megacities in the world. The United States alone adds about 930 square miles of rooftops every year. We're expected to reach 70% urban worldwide population uh, by 2050. And typically, urban areas are made up of 60 to 70% man-made surfaces, such as concrete for all the sidewalks, asphalt for all the roads, and then buildings and rooftops. So we're expanding our urban areas, and in all those urban areas, we're taking out our impervious surfaces or our pervious surfaces, and we're adding impervious surfaces. So this puts us at a higher risk of environmental hazards, such as the increased urban heat island, uh, which if you're not familiar with, it just pretty much states that in urban areas, the temperatures are higher than in the rural areas. Uh, things like increased water runoff, uh, reduced infiltration capacity of soils, air pollution, uh, our tree canopy is shrinking, and we have excessive noise pollution because of this. Uh, in the past eight years, we've seen the hottest eight years on record in the world. And this is a, this chart, if you can't, um, uh, can't read, is from, uh, it's the difference, the average temperature difference of the past 30 years uh, that, was, that was seen in uh, 2022. So this is a, in 2022, you can see the red areas are hotter than average for the past 30 year average. Blue areas are a little cooler. So while you could look at this and say, well, there is a significant amount of blue areas in here. You can see the deep red that's really kind of happening around our band, uh, pretty much from about the 30 to 45 or 50 latitude. And then we've got some really hot areas up in the poles. Uh, you can see at the very bottom, it's been 46 years since we've had a colder than average temperature on Earth. And even when kind of the Earth, uh, not necessarily shut down, but in the midst of COVID, when people weren't traveling and out as much or putting as much emissions into the city, we still had one of the top hottest years. This is a really interesting, I'm not gonna read all of this to y'all, uh, graphic that I came across in, uh, on NOAA's website. This is a climate uh, abnormalities from 2022. Everything that I highlighted is just uh, talking about how those regions were hotter than average or warmer than average or a you know, top 10, top 15 warmest year on average. Uh, globally. And because our temperatures are changing, it, it leads to wetter areas in some parts of the globe and drier areas in other parts of the globe. So you can see somewhere uh, out in California, if you remember, there's it's a lot of uh, dry wildfires where we've got a lot of hurricanes and cyclones moving through about the central belt of the, of the world. So when we look at urban heat island, uh, over the past 50 years, our urban temperatures have been rising by about two degrees per decade. So over the past 50 years, our urban areas have risen by about 10 degrees on average. Um, the UHI contributes to a temperature differential of about 12 degrees between urban and rural areas. And as I said, it uh, leads to some wetter areas of the globe and some drier areas of the globe, depending on where you are. And it also leads to more air pollution. So we've got droughts in, other, in some areas of the world. We have flooding in others. So this was a, an image of the 2009 flood in Atlanta, if anybody remembers that. Um, I remember when Spaghetti Junction was almost was flooding, and it was like, what, what is even happening here? So uh, speaking of stormwater, uh, increased urban areas obviously uh, increase the removal or they uh, they remove pervious surfaces and increase the uh, decrease the infiltration capacities of the soils within our cities um, and even uh, soils that aren't developed are heavily impacted because if you think about it, if there's a construction project and you have to store the uh, construction materials or construction equipment on a neighboring lot and that lot is not developed that uh, the soils are still getting compacted and so they're not able to um, take in as much water as they could before. We're exceeding our storm limits um, and flooding is increasing. We're experiencing what's called CSOs or combined sewer overflows, 
where some areas of the city, uh, the sewer systems are designed to take in stormwater and domestic sewage and wastewater all in one pipe. And so when these aren't designed for the rainfall events that we're getting, it's flooding out and that's when you've seen pictures of sewage or um, things you don't want flooding out in your street, flooding out in the street. So I wanted to put some audience participation. I'm gonna make at least like two people say something out loud just to make sure everybody's awake. So if we have one gallon of water, uh, sorry, not one gallon of water. Uh, if we have one inch of rain that falls on a one acre site, so if I have a one acre square and I dump one inch of water on it, how many gallons is being produced in that one acre? Just over 27,000 gallons. Sorry if I beat you to it, Brad. So that's a lot of water, right, that falls over just one acre of land and one inch of rain. If one inch of rain falls on Atlanta, we get about 2.3 billion gallons of, uh, of storm water. And while that's not all going into the exact, say, like one pipe, and that one pipe has to figure out how to transport all that water, it's just an illustration to show uh, one inch of rain, which happens uh, fairly often, especially in the summers, we get some of what uh, my boss used to call Friday afternoon frog stranglers, where it, where it rains really fast, floods up a little bit, and then kind of dissipates. That's 2.3 billion gallons of water that falls on the land. And uh, we average about 50 inches of rain a year, but in 2018, we saw 70 inches of rain. So that was an extra 20 inches, so that was about 46 billion gallons of extra storm water that our, um, our sewer, or storm systems had to, uh, had to accommodate for. Let's talk a little bit about air pollution. Uh, obviously, air pollution in urban areas uh, rise due to uh, industrial activity, energy production, vehicular use, and emission output. Uh, you can be exposed to up to 200 different air pollutants in urban areas. Uh, these can lead to things such as cardiovascular disease, strokes, uh, lung, and other health issues. And 90% of the world's population under the age of 15 breathe in harmful air every single day. Um, air pollution in itself is deadlier than cigarettes or alcohol. Air pollution takes off about two years of global life expectancy. We're lucky to live in a, you know, Atlanta, Athens, Georgia, kind of the southeast. We, have, uh, we don't have a lot of really terrible air pollution issues. Uh, maybe in the early 90s, Atlanta experienced more smoggy days or days that were graded F um, uh, on the, the health index. But Atlanta's, Atlanta's doing a really good job uh, compared to other parts of the country or other parts of the world. So we don't have to worry about this as much, but it's still something that uh, wherever you end up practicing and working that you need to think about in your designs. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Metro Atlanta and what's happened over the past 35 years. Uh, you can see that everything on the right-hand side, this, this correlates with trees, amount of trees. All the numbers on the left-hand side correlate to urban areas. So you can see that the urban over the past 33 years has continued to climb up until about 2011 and stayed fairly steady. And it's almost an inverse of what's happening with the trees. As we develop urban areas, we're losing our tree canopy. We've lost about 400,000 acres of trees in Metro Atlanta, and we've gained about 375,000 acres of, of urban space. Uh, in 2018, there was a study that was done that uh, showed that Georgia leads the United States with the greatest annual net loss of tree canopy at about 18,830 acres per year. Anybody have any idea about how big the size UGA's campus is in Athens? Any guesses? Jacob, what do you got? Say what? 18,830 18, 18, acres. <laughs> UGA's campus is about 700 and just under 770 acres. So that's about 24 and a half times the size of UGA's campus that we were losing every year. Um, I apologize for the constant facts and figures, but you know, as we it's important to kind of understand all this while in order to understand the benefits of vegetated roofs. There's a lot of numbers on this, so I'm just going to hit this really quickly and tell you what this, this actually shows. The city of Atlanta um, has documents that will give you tree replacement uh, and removal data over the past few years. And so I was able to go on and find from 2014 to 2022. So over those nine years, uh, yep, nine years. There's been 65,657 trees that have been approved for removal. 
And whenever you remove a tree, you always measure it. DBH stands for diameter of breast height. So the diameter inches at breast height is just over a million inches that have been approved to, to be removed. There's also a category called DDH, which is dead, dying, or hazardous. So you could go to an arborist and say, well, this tree is uh, experiencing um, you know, crown depletion or it's dead. So they can categorize that as DDH so you don't have to uh, you don't have to replace that as a one-for-one one like you do for the uh, approved to be removed. So if we add in all the DDH trees, we've removed in those nine years about 137,000 trees at two and a half million inches diameter breast height. We've planted back 59,832 trees at 191,612 inches. And that caliper inches is typically measured six inches or a foot off the ground. So it's not diameter breast height inches. So if you look at just replanted versus approved for removal, we're replanting only at about a 91% rate. If you look at the total trees, we're replanting at about a 43% rate for everything that was taken out. So uh, some of these trees, the DDH, you can't say, I can't say, well, some of those might have been healthy. Or I can't really say that all of those necessarily were DDH. Um, but some staggering we're somewhere between 91 and 43 percent uh, replacement. And one of the main issues is when you take trees out versus when you put trees in, you're typically taking out more mature established trees and then you're putting in typically like a, a red maple stick. Um, and so what the ecosystem services of a well-established tree is giving you, you're not going to be able to recoup that for the first five, 10, 15 at least years and what you're replanting if that survives and thrives in an urban area that you're giving it. So the, the Forest Service put out, um, put out a document that, that talks about different, uh, different tree species, evergreens, flowering, understory, and shade trees, and some of the service benefits that they provide in different regions of the US. So I picked out red maples uh, for the southeast they can intercept almost 4,800 gallons a year, but a five-year red maple can only intercept about 200 gallons. So it takes a long time for that red maple to fully perform um, all that it can. A five-year-old red maple can sequester about 40 pounds of carbon, but a 40-year-old can sequester about 740. So we're taking out these larger trees and then we're planting in. Uh, we're not getting the, the same like-for-like -like ecosystem uh, benefits um, that we had. All right, so as we look into Atlanta, uh, the graphic on the left is tree canopy uh, lost between 20, or 2000 and 2019. So 2000 is the dark green, 2019 is the light green, and if we isolate that, we see that all the tree canopy loss in the red that we've uh, experienced over those 19 years. If we look at tree and vegetation cover, in the city of Atlanta from 2018 on the left. And then on the area on the right, this is supposed to be pixelated. This is our per, uh, percent tree cover in 2018. So you can see that the areas of least tree cover, downtown, midtown, Buckhead, along the 75, 85, I-20 corridors, uh, the more industrialized areas. And then lastly, you can see that our tree loss over uh, 2008 to 2018, areas like Buckhead and Brookhaven, which have been rapidly expanding, uh, if you know the areas, are somewhere between 15 and 30% tree loss over those 10 years. Uh, and then there's Atlanta Industrial Park, which has been developed. Downtown's kind of stayed around the same just because there's not a lot of trees uh, left to take out. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what are some of the current issues, and then we're going to get into the last part, which is the vegetated roof um, and, and their benefits. So currently, how can we combat climate change and the negative impacts of urbanization uh, and development? We can uh, use smarter stormwater management, green streets, which falls into that same stormwater management uh, category, things like vegetated walls, solar panning, uh, solar power, excuse me, white roofs, and while we're all here, vegetated roofs. In 2013, the city uh, of Atlanta passed the Post-Development Stormwater Management Ordinance, which was one of the leading in the country at the time. And it just essentially says that on developed sites, whenever you're developing a site, you have to capture the first inch of rainfall on site before anything goes into the sewer system. So they've, um, 
the city has estimated they keep about 1.1 billion gallons of water out of the sewers every year because of that. Brad, you might be familiar with this image. This is uh, up in Portland. Uh, this is a Green Streets project of 12th Avenue in Portland. And essentially what we're looking at is we're, as we're sloping down the street, we have curb cuts on um, the street side and then on the pedestrian side, the sidewalk slopes into these kind of bioretention stormwater cells. So water comes down the street and instead of just getting uh, captured in a curb inlet and sent to the sewers, comes into these little cells, fills this up, goes out the next, uh, the next cut until it goes into the, the following cell. So it helps to capture pollutants that aren't being uh, put into our um, stormwater systems and it helps keep water out of, um, out of the sewers. This is a, uh, an example of a, a green wall project uh, actually in Atlanta, a vegetated wall project. This is, um, this is a project we worked on at HGR and our boss sent out uh, a piece of paper and had us do a little design competition and say, design this however you wanted to. And I really wanted to um, orient all the plants so it looked like a Tetris game was being played, but I lost that argument and uh, it does not look like a Tetris. Uh, and then of course, uh, tree planting. Uh, anytime you're uh, developing master plans, street tree planting, especially when you're developing in urban areas um, because of the uh, ecosystem uh, benefit and services that they provide to us. So talking about uh, trees a little bit, we've, uh, our urban tree coverage in the United States is only at about 27%. We've increased from 16 and a half million acres to 24 million acres over the past 20 years. Uh, but that 27% is still an incredibly, shockingly known, low number. Uh, we do have an organization called Trees Atlanta, um, which advocates for the, um, uh, for the planting and uh, maintenance of uh, trees around the city. From 85 to 13, they planted 88,000 trees. Uh, but in that same time, we were moving about 50 acres a day due to development. So the amount that we, uh, that we took out, or amount of what they planted was equal to what we lost in just one month's time. So while they're doing a great job, uh, during that time we were just rampantly sprawling, urbanizing uh, so much that we were losing uh, just a ridiculous amount of trees. Uh, even so, you all probably heard that, uh, we might have heard that we're deemed city in the forest uh, we went to an Atlanta United game the other day, and they have on their new forest kits, which are green, they have a logo or like an insignia that says City in the Forest. And so they had these scarves, and so the first thing I thought of was like, oh, i got to grab one of those and put it in my office because it's cool. Um, so it's good that we're acknowledging that and getting that out into a more mainstream um, area. When I wrote my thesis a few years ago, uh, this number was up in the 48 and change percent, and now it's down to 46. So in two years, we've dropped from 48 to 46 percent uh, tree canopy cover. Um, downtown has about less than 5 percent canopy coverage, and the thing that's our saving grace is that the city is covered so much by single-family um, housing, and that's kind of what holds the, most, the majority of our tree canopy. All right, now let's get to vegetated roofs. How can they help us against the issue and how can they help us moving forward? Well, vegetated roofs provide energy savings to buildings. We'll talk about that in just a second. They provide uh, air quality and pollutant capture in downtown areas, um, stormwater reductions, reduced health costs because of the air pollutant capture. Um, they provide noise reduction, so, uh, sort of a buffer to some of the top floors and buildings. They can provide food production. Uh, the, building where my wife works has a whole bunch of honeybees on top of the roof and so she came home the other day with a whole bunch of jars of honey that were um, collected and uh, jarred on site. They can provide amenities for buildings and then aesthetics to neighboring buildings looking down on them. There's a website called Green Roofs for Healthy Cities that performs industry surveys of uh, vegetated roof development throughout the uh, years. And they go back to 2012. So you can see that uh, what they do is they send out industry surveys and they collect all the data and results and tally up how many 
uh, square feet of vegetated roofs have been developed over those years. So over the six years that they have, uh, that I have access to seeing, there's a total of about 31.9 million square feet or about 5 million square feet developed a year. This obviously, this is not 100% uh, accurate to everything that's being developed in the U.S. because this is only as accurate as people will respond to the surveys. So it's probably undercutting by about 25 to 50%. But if you can think back to, um, uh, we're building 930 square miles of rooftops every single year. So if we only developed 1% of that, we would be a worldwide leader. Uh, New York City alone has about 100 or 1.6 billion square feet of rooftops. So 1.6 available, and we're developing you know, 7.4 at the most, 3.1 at the least. Uh, from 2013, you can see some of the major cities that were uh, the top 10 in the development list. And then in 2019, uh, Washington and Chicago stayed the top two. Toronto overtook New York. Uh, and then this was odd to me. South Bend, Indiana was on the list. They developed, uh, if, you, if you go on Google Earth and look right next to their football stadium, it's like their basketball arena and like sports complex. They put a vegetated roof, an extensive roof on the top of that. So I think that's the only reason why South Bend got in there for 2019. But I had to see it to believe it. So out of those top tens, why is Atlanta not on any list? Well, there's a couple, couple uh, big reasons. In 2010, our sustainability plan uh, does not have any mention of vegetated roof development. 2016 comprehensive development plan has no plan for implementation, nor does the green infrastructure strategic action plan of 2018. And then the 2020 downtown sustainability action plan has no definite plan for vegetated roof development, except every time they mention green roofs, there's the magic word of could. So green roofs could be used. You could do this, but there's no definite plan for implementation. Whereas a whole bunch of other cities have mandates uh, where they require mandatory vegetated roof uh, development on new construction. A lot of other cities you can see have incentive programs to where it's not mandated, but you get more floor area so you can build slightly larger buildings if you put a vegetated roof on the building. So one of the main reasons why we're not on these lists, in my opinion, is because we don't have a definite plan, we don't have mandates, we don't have incentives around their inclusion. One reason why I think that we probably don't have that is because um, a lot of these plans are probably uh, um, ghost-driven by possibly developers. and. It's expensive to develop vegetated roofs. Typical bare roof is about seven to fifteen dollars a square foot. A vegetated roof is anywhere between around ten and twelve dollars more per square foot. Kind of hard to put a number on an intensive roof, but up to seventy dollars plus per square foot, depending on the plant material. Um, if you retrofit, depending on the structural upgrades you have to do to the buildings. If you remember uh, back to the beginning of the talk when I was talking about how Germany uh, kind of led the way in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, their uh, interest in development has caused uh, a lot more suppliers to come up. The contractors are a lot more knowledgeable about vegetated roof development. And because of that, they're typically about 35% of the cost of U.S. roofs. Uh, the one good thing is that vegetated roofs can become net positive, so all the benefits that they provide to the economy and to the uh, developer, after about 20 years, they can become net positive, which is one of the saving graces. So in, the, in my thesis, uh, in, in this talk, this is, this is kind of the end of all the, the facts and figures, and I'm going to talk about um, what's called projective design. So this was, the, uh, this was the image that you saw at the very beginning. This was looking out uh, into the neighboring rooftop. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to figure out, well, if this was developed into a vegetated roof, what are the benefits uh, economically, environmentally, socially that this could provide? So a, a typical office building is, has about a 25,000 square foot floor plate. And so if we were to take in areas of HVAC, um, 
and then if we were to, if we were to think about all the HVAC or utilities that are on the roof, and then give some areas for walking around, uh, we could probably get about a 20,000 square foot vegetated roof on um, on top of a building. Uh, in plan view, uh, this might what it look like. Uh, this would be covered in sedums, grasses, or native plantings. And there's a there's a um, um, there's a company in Illinois that put together a kind of green infrastructure development package, which talks about the benefits of extensive vegetated roofs uh, in different parts of the country. And so you can kind of plug in where you are and get an idea of the uh, savings or benefits that can come about developing extensive vegetated roof. So in energy savings, uh, you can save uh, cooling in the summer and save on heating in the winter through the insulation provided by the vegetated roofs. You could expect to save around $1,900 a year, whereas that same Forest Service uh, study that I mentioned earlier puts a red maple average over 40-year life at about 1162 a year. You can see the difference in air pollution capture and the, the monetary benefit of that versus a red maple. And then also one of the big ones is the a four inch uh, substrate extensive vegetated roof could capture around um, 400,000 gallons of stormwater. So pretty much what, uh, what this kind of boils down to is trees really excel in air pollution capture, um, carbon sequestration. And the nice thing about trees is that they can be installed at a fraction of the cost because uh, they don't cost nearly as much. But the roofs really excel in energy reduction and stormwater capture. Um, and they can also extend the life of a roof. So uh, if we were to do the math out, we get about 168 red maples it would take uh, to provide the same uh, energy savings as a 20,000 square foot vegetated roof, 18 to 29 for the same for air pollution, and about 83 red maples would provide the same benefit of, uh, of stormwater uh, capture. All right, the last little bit uh, this is the city limits of Atlanta. We're at about 134 square miles. We have a population of around 500,000. Metro, we're about 6.1 million. But it's estimated that we could get up to just over a million residents within city limits by 2040. So we could almost double the population in the next 15 years, um, theoretically. This is a, a, a graphic of all the rooftops within the city limits. And if we think back about the vegetated cover uh, that I showed y'all earlier in the talk, this is essentially vegetation on top of the rooftops within the city of Atlanta. So it doesn't look uh, maybe like there's a lot of open rooftops uh, that we could really get out of this, but if we kind of take away that coverage, we have 131 million square feet of rooftops that are not covered in vegetation currently in the city of Atlanta. So if we were, uh, if you think about 131 million, uh, if you think about what was developed uh, through the industry surveys of the Green Roofs for Healthy Cities, averaged about five million a year. So if we developed just 1% of what we had available, we would be up there with Washington, D.C. We'd be above South Bend, Indiana in uh, vegetated roof development. And that's what 1% development looks like. So 1% would uh, make Atlanta a national leader in vegetated roof development. We go even further, 5%, 10%, 25%, and we could go crazy and go 100% coverage. It's 131 million square feet. Is it ever going to happen? Sadly, no, because it's going to cost a lot of money. But we can dream, right? The low end of 1% could save the city about $150,000 a year. The high end of 100% uh, coverage could save almost uh, $21.5 million annually. And that comes in the form of stormwater uh, treatment costs, comes in the form of um, health care reductions, uh, energy savings, things like that. All right, last little bit of audience participation. 1% adoption removes the same stormwater as how many 10-year-old red maples? So 26 million gallons. Any guesses? Claire, what do you think? Um, 
100 red maples. That's very close. Uh, slightly more, about 32,000. <laughs> but if we're rounding up, I think we got it. Uh, so about 32,000. So if you remember uh, back, um, probably not because there's been a lot of information uh, presented in the past 40 minutes. Trees Atlanta planted about 88,000 trees. So that's about almost half of what uh, Trees Atlanta planted over that 30-year period that we could see with 1% um, with adoption rate. So what can we do? Uh, how can we, how can, how can we um, change our cities? Uh, we can continue to educate ourselves uh, and others on vegetated roofs and the benefits that they provide to development. Uh, when you go off to your internships, you can ask your, um, ask your bosses, ask your project managers if they're developing any vegetated roofs. Whenever you go out to client meetings, you can talk to the developers about development of vegetated rooftops. We can continue to research, build, uh, and test vegetated roofs. We need to develop our cities smarter, and we need to advocate for the inclusion of vegetated roofs wherever possible. So that we can take this and maybe start with this, just 1%, and turn it into this one day. One day when y'all are practicing fantastically successful landscape architects. Uh, and then my uh, overall uh, goal is that the scarf that I showed you before, maybe one side says that Atlanta, as we're, as we're waving it proud for our team, is not just the city in the forest, but also the city, oops, sorry, the city under the sedums. So thank you very much. <laughs>